Hello and welcome to our last session for today for JU and OSEARCH Virtual Marine Science Camp. Um, we hope that you were able to tune in for our other sessions yesterday and this morning and at one o'clock this afternoon. Um, and if not, we that information is still available. You can go back and watch it. Um, we also have some excellent um, guests the rest of the week. So tomorrow morning, we will be talking about manatees with Dr. Jerry Pinto, corals with Dr. Dan McCarthy. Um, we have Chloe Prayon talking about sharks at 1 p.m. tomorrow. And we have Lucas Mears uh, talking about sea turtles at 3 p.m. in the afternoon and we'll have some interesting video content to go along with those and of course our question and answer. Now I am going to cut over to Keith Crowley from the Living Sharks Museum and he is going to talk about prehistoric sharks. Hi Keith, how are you? Oh, I need to take the mute off. Hi Keith, how are you? Oh, good. How are you? Very good. So pleased that you could be with us today. Can you tell us a bit about the Living Shark Museum and what you do there? Of course. So Living Sharks Museum is potentially America's first shark history museum. Very uh, cool. Mostly because I don't know anybody who's ever seen another. Uh, Atlantic White Shark Conservancy has a shark center up in Cape Cod. Uh, they're focused on the great white sharks up in the Cape. Uh, and their shark center doesn't cover too much of shark history. So um, in a lot of ways, we're able to work together. Awesome. So how did you get to work at the Living Sharks Museum? What's your background? Um, believe it or not, uh, I actually don't have a professional background, uh, or I should say a collegiate background. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't go to school for sharks or biology or um, anything in the marine sciences. Uh, so my story is a very unique one. Uh, and my goal here, uh, of course, is to suggest that if you can go to school for this stuff, please do it <laughs> <laughs> because it will afford you a lot more opportunities, uh, especially on the level of actually being able to make some change and make some formal records in the world of sharks. Uh, for me, uh, well, I mean, I, I grew up reading Jaws, of course, like everyone else. Uh, many people were afraid of Jaws. Uh, I was intrigued by it. Very cool. I know a few other people that um, have a love of a, a particular marine organism and no formal training in it and have made a living and uh, you're the only one I know who's made a full museum out of it, but um, that's a wonderful example. I, I tend to go overboard with everything I do, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I know a lot of folks in the shark world who were inspired by the, the film Jaws rather than afraid of it uh, and ended up getting degrees in marine biology and started studying sharks. Uh, for me in high school, I started trying to get any opportunity that I could uh, to study prehistoric sharks uh, because prehistoric sharks were very accessible to me. Uh, I lived on the coast in Connecticut uh, while prehistoric sharks weren't accessible there. Um, the eastern seaboard uh, is very productive for uh, sites to collect prehistoric shark material. Uh, so in high school, and especially in the summertime, I used to jump in my car and just drive. And I would drive hours and hours. I'd drive seven hours down to Maryland just to spend two days digging around uh, or diving uh, for fossil shark's teeth. Um, and I did what I could uh, to learn as much as I could. I read all the books that I could find uh, to get to know the world of the prehistoric shark. Uh, mostly thinking that because I wasn't going to have an opportunity to go to school, that I might not have an opportunity to work with modern sharks. So I study prehistoric sharks. I've got two questions for you. So one, I w wondered if you could define prehistoric sharks for us. And then the other one was, um, I think you mentioned fossilized shark's teeth. And I just explained that to a friend the other day, but I think you could do a better job. So could you start with what you mean by prehistoric sharks and then the, so, the fossil shark's teeth? Of course. Uh, any shark that doesn't live today, uh, we consider prehistoric. Um, however, a fossil shark usually has to be over 40,000 years old. Um, and fossil shark material has to have transformed. Uh, we call it mineralized. Uh, it's turned into a, another structure entirely. Excellent. Um, so uh, obviously sharks are made of cartilage. So their bones, their skeletons, unfortunately, 
very rarely fossilize, uh, but their teeth do. And we also know that modern sharks go through about 30,000 teeth in their lifetime. So the same goes for prehistoric sharks. That actually makes prehistoric sharks' teeth some of the most common fossils to find in the world. So how would I identify a fossilized shark's tooth compared to a tooth that fell out of a shark's mouth, you know, two years ago? Uh, well, when I was 16 and I was down in Calvert Cliffs, Maryland, uh, I was at the Matoka Beach Cabins, getting to know the family there that ran uh, that area. Uh, they had cliff access there and you could go down and look for shark's teeth. And it's an old woman there who uh, knew all her fossils. Uh, for years and years, she had been down there collecting and, and seeing visitors collect. And she told me, the way you tell is you bite it. <laughs> it's like, if, you, if, it, if it tastes like stone, then it's probably a fossil. <laughs> wow. Uh, or that's a very primitive way of going about it. But of course, uh, fossilized shark's teeth have been completely replaced by mineral. Um, so it will be a stone structure versus um, the tooth structure of a modern shark. Now I'm wondering if you've tasted everything in your museum. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> so of course, like a modern great white shark tooth, we can see here is very white in color. Uh -huh. uh, even its root is white. Of course, this has been cleaned, but uh -huh. I was just having a conversation with somebody I'm working with uh, right now um, with another project, and I was trying to explain that even if this tooth came out of the shark now, uh, say, maybe bit a surfboard or a random object and left a tooth in it, uh, it would actually still look pretty much this color, uh -huh. maybe a little bit of staining you know, from the gum line, uh, but it doesn't take much to clean these up. A fossilized prehistoric white shark tooth can actually be very different in color. It can be extremely rare to find one that was white because the chemicals in the soil around what fossilized this tooth would influence its color. And we would find great white shark's teeth that are prehistoric, that are tan in color, dark brown, even black in color. Awesome. So I'm feeling in questions from YouTube Live and someone wants to know, is it possible for me to find a prehistoric shark tooth in South Carolina? Oh, absolutely. That's one of the best places in the world to find sharks, teeth. There you go, uh, Army Aviator. You're lucky day. That's who the person is. Sorry, that's their handle. That's one of the best you, places. Why is that? Do you know? Well, if you're willing to do some diving in some murky, kind of creepy Ooh. places, <laughs> you, you definitely can find some sharks' teeth in some of the rivers. Of course, the ocean uh, was a lot further inland back during the time that the sharks that lived in South Carolina uh, lived. So the rivers actually create exposures for prehistoric shark's teeth to be found. And not just shark's teeth, but other marine mammals and, and animals that lived during that time as well. Right, right. We call that the paleo shark diet. Ah, yes. We find some uh, giant um, sloths here in the St. John's River, their bones and teeth along the river um, that are pretty amazing. Awesome. Those things were huge. I don't know if sharks ate them, but uh, maybe if they could get a hold of them. So I find all different bones when I look for prehistoric shark's teeth. Uh, and that helps me learn a little bit about the, the diet of the species that lived in that area. For instance, here's a vertebrae of a tuna. Uh, so there were tuna very similar to today's tuna that lived uh, in this particular case around the Calvert Cliffs region of, of Maryland. Uh, so this was potentially a food source for some of the prehistoric sharks that lived there. That looks like a, a large sharks, tuna. Bigger yeah, tuna back then? Really yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, a lot of the sharks that lived uh, around that area are actually very similar to the sharks we still have today. Uh, I'd like to say relatively unchanged. Interesting. One of, the, one of the things that people like to say is that sharks haven't changed in millions of years. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not true at all. Okay. Uh, there are some species that seem to be relatively unchanged within the past two to you know, 15 million years maybe, uh, which is still a very long time. But sharks have been around for 450 million years. So there have definitely been uh, radical time. changes in the world of the shark. And unfortunately, without skeletons, without uh, you know being able to see what those sharks actually look like, we really only can propose what they look like based on their teeth. And so we compare the teeth of prehistoric sharks with the sharks that live today. 
So when we look at, for instance, um, like a modern day mako shark tooth, this would be very difficult to see. So I'm going to use, I'm going to try to use this megaphone glass. Okay. Um, so we have a modern mako shark tooth here. Maybe a little and, closer. Sure. Yeah. Great. Thank there you. There we go. So a modern mako shark tooth doesn't have any serrations like a great white shark's tooth does. Um, and this is a tooth further back in the jaw, so it's a little thicker, uh, it's a little stubbier, it's a strong tooth. And we find prehistoric mako shark teeth that look very similar to this. And the only way we were able to categorize them, or I should say paleontologists who study this stuff, uh, were able to categorize them was by comparing the shape, the tooth shape, to a modern shark's tooth shape and make some assessments and some assumptions uh, very educated assumptions mm -hmm. that say that this particular tooth falls in the lineage of mako shark. Wow. Uh, this is Cosmopolitotus, uh, recently changed for Mycerus. Uh, also, Calvert Cliffs fine. I've got a lot of Calvert Cliffs fines on my table right now for whatever reason. But just to tell you how radical uh, prehistoric shark's teeth can be, here's another mako shark tooth, but this one's from California. Whoa. And this is a very different type of shape. Yes. So this is called a hooked mako shark. Wow. And you can see a very and strong angle. And I'm guessing that, that point would point to the back of the throat so that if the prey pulled against it, they'd be stuck. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Do you mind then, fielding uh, random questions? Someone course, wants to it. know how rare megalodon shark's teeth are because they thought they were rare, but then a friend visited, I don't know where they live, and they found three or four. Well, that sounds amazing to me. That's awesome. That's a great day. <laughs> That's a good day. <laughs> so pretty um, rare, a pretty special find. So I like to compare uh, fossil finding to modern day fishing. Okay. Uh, the technology has changed, so we're getting better at fishing. And the same goes for finding prehistoric sharks. Uh, now that we know where some of these locations are, people are using scuba gear, uh, and they're going out there and they're finding loads of teeth, whereas you know, just a few decades ago, that was very hard to do. So I would say that megalodon is more common than you might think. Okay. Uh, but some of the hot spots are starting to dry up. So a lot of fossils are only found because uh, the ecosystem where those fossils are locked gets exposed somehow. And there's only a few different ways that can happen. The weather can do that. So natural erosion can open up the earth and reveal fossil material. Or uh, humans can do that too by digging the earth and building a shopping mall <laughs> or, or dredging a river. These are different ways that some of this material can get exposed. And then all of a sudden there's a new hot spot. Gotcha. So the earth is always changing. Conditions are always changing. And if they lose 30,000 teeth in their lifetime per individual shark, they gotta be around somewhere, so keep hunting. True, true. So someone asked, is it true, and I have never heard this, that all sharks' teeth look like their dorsal fins? I wouldn't say that's necessarily true, um, but in the prehistoric record, that's going to be very difficult to tell. Yeah, right, because we don't know what their dorsal fin looks like. Well, and, and it, within a shark mouth, they can have many different shapes of teeth, right? Like we have different shapes of teeth. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's all based on their behavior, their feeding behavior, and what's necessary for them to survive. Sharks don't have hands. They don't have other tools to use. They rely on teeth all their lives to do the job that needs to be done to keep them alive. So yes, every shark tooth is specialized. And that goes for prehistoric sharks as well. So, of course, uh, the megalodon tooth wow. very is very cool. similar to a great white shark tooth. However, it's it's very thick in construction, That's amazing. which leads us to believe this animal was very large and it would probably require a, a strong bite force to do the job that was necessary to feed. And we also believe that it would probably use its entire body to achieve that bite. Uh, so think of all the power that is being built within an animal that could be 50 to 60 feet long, ramming its prey with these huge, thick, strong, serrated teeth. 
So I don't expect you to know everything there is to know about all pre prehistoric sharks, but do you know what the diet or the, the guest diet of megalodons were? Well, uh, unfortunately not really being able to see predator and prey right. actions yeah. uh, like we can see today with modern sharks. Uh, we're limited on how we can tell, but one way we can tell is by monitoring the other prehistoric material we find in some of the same sites. So while I may find tuna vertebrae in some places, uh, sometimes I find uh, whale vertebrae. Wow. Um, so I'll find the, the skeletons of prehistoric whales, porpoises, dolphins, uh, sea lions, or seals, I should say, uh, and other marine mammals in those same sites. And sometimes the bones of those animals can reveal marks that may be telltale signs of feeding. Now, uh, this one's gonna be very hard for you to see. I'm gonna try this technique one okay. more time. But if we look very closely at this, yeah, um, you'll see three marks here. Yeah, three I can see them. Coming up. Uh, that is feeding damage from a shark. Uh, so that is something that we can, we can use to learn a little bit more about what the sharks may have been consuming in that environment. That is cool. So we call that a trace fossil. And that's, that's the trace of an animal that, uh, that, this is not the physical fossil of that animal, but it's a trace left behind by that animal. Very cool. Do you know, and again, we don't expect you to have answers to every question, but what the biggest shark to ever be found was? The biggest prehistoric shark? It doesn't say that. <laughs> yes, let's say prehistoric <laughs> shark. I'm assuming so that the talking. largest shark on Earth ever was probably a prehistoric shark because most species are getting smaller, but maybe I'm wrong. No, you, are, you are right. Of course, whale sharks are very large. Right. Um, they do rival most animals in the ocean, if not being the largest, um, up to the blue whale, of course. But um, megalodon is still the largest shark that we've ever seen in, in our prehistoric oceans so far. Okay. And a 50 to 60 foot long shark. Now that's hard to beat. There's a lot of other prehistoric sharks that fall within its lineage that maybe over time as we continue to learn more about prehistoric sharks and find more fossils of prehistoric sharks, maybe we'll find one that rivals Megalodon. For instance, uh, there are some members of the Mako family, uh, wow. like Angustodons, uh, that looks very similar to Megalodon, but smaller in stature so far but some of these teeth have been seen to grow between three and four inches. Now, that's still a big tooth. That's still a very large shark. So maybe there's larger sharks out there that we just haven't found yet. I keep getting a question. Isn't a megalodon's real name, and I'm, I, I may be mispronouncing this, but I would say Charcadon, C-H-A-R-C-H-A-D-O-N. Say it again correctly. Sure, Cacaradon. Cacaradon. Uh, so there's actually, that's that's an age-old debate, which is still being settled on. It depends on which paleontologist you talk to who studies the prehistoric sharks. Not everybody agrees on the name of Megalodon. So some folks believe that Megalodon actually falls in the white shark lineage, hence Cacaradon, uh, just like Cacaradon cacarius for the great white shark. Okay. Um, however, there are others that believe that it falls in the Mako lineage, and they say Cacaracles. Cacarcles or Cacarcles megalodon. So it depends on who you talk to. Uh, again, because we, we were limited to the, sh the teeth. Uh, right. That's all we really know about these sharks. Uh, they are constantly up for change and debate. So someone wrote, Hunter wrote, I heard some prehistoric sea creatures are bigger than a megalodon. That's true, correct? Some prehistoric sea creatures, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's some marine reptiles that live, especially during the Cretaceous, that could have rivaled, if not been bigger than the Megalodon. Um, and then someone said, how much do the teeth weigh? Now, they don't say which teeth, but I'm assuming, how much does the largest teeth, well, and the thing is, the teeth that you have, they're fossilized, so it's not necessarily representative of what the original tooth from a a cacaradon or a megalodon mouth would have weighed, right? That's but, right. That's what, right. So it's been replaced by minerals. So it's a much denser specimen now. Okay. Um, so a megalodon tooth is it's pretty heavy. 
Um, I'm not sure what what the answers on that would be. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So uh, to whoever asked that, I'm losing it in the comments. You're going to have to go out and find one and try it. And um, that's the best way. Know that there will be fossilized, and so it's going to be heavier than the actual tooth. Um, did prehistoric sharks, such as Megalodon, come from the Tylosaurus? That's an interesting question. So Tylosaurus is a member of the Mosasaur family. And actually, a Tylosaurus is a marine reptile. Oh. So in a, in a very different class of animals. So no, uh, so it's, the answer. it's very unlikely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tylosaurus was about 45 feet long. Uh, that's, that's a very large marine reptile. There are a lot of prehistoric sharks that lived along with uh, Tylosaurus out in Kansas, which is shallow inland seas. Okay, I've got a couple of questions that keep getting repeated. So one is, have you ever found a full set of cookie cutter shark teeth? I hadn't been asking that one because cookie cutter sharks are not prehistoric, right? But have you ever found a full mouth of cookie cutter shark teeth? I have not. Okay. I have not. There, there are, I have seen people uh, who also collect fossil shark's teeth uh, say that they have found prehistoric cookie cutter shark teeth, but I have not seen them in person yet. Okay. And then a lot of people want to know where to go find their own fossils. So you sort of touched on that, but I don't know if you want to tell them where to, you know, to mine them, but you said to scuba dive in murky waters, right? Up and down the Eastern <laughs> seaboard. Someone asked about California, which I think is a great question because the coastline is very different there. Um, and I haven't heard of, I, so I, I lived in California for many years, but I grew up here in Jacksonville, and I know a lot more people find shark's teeth here than I ever heard of finding them on the West Coast because of our coastlines, yes. right? Yes, that is true. So you um, would recommend the East Coast? The East Coast is so productive. Uh, there's so many different places from New Jersey on down. Uh, there's a big brook and Navison formations in New Jersey, great places to find uh, very small uh, but very awesome shark's teeth, uh, especially you know, one of my favorites, uh, Squalicorax, the crow shark. Uh, I don't have an example in front of me, unfortunately, but uh, just a really cool shark's tooth. Tell me about uh, the crow find... shark. So we we don't know a whole lot about the crow shark. There are there are a few different examples of crow shark teeth in the world. Uh, we don't really know what they look like, uh, but the crow shark tooth uh, has a very similar. Uh, shaped to this one here. Huh. This is Edestus. Um, I could pull away and I could pull a crow shark tooth and show you. If, if you give me just a second. Sure. So I see some of you have asked about finding um, shark's teeth in Florida and really close to where we are at Jacksonville University is a beach called Michler's Landing. And if you Google it, it's known to be one of the best spots in the world for finding shark's teeth. So if you come to Marine Science Camp in person next summer or you come here as a college student or a grad student, we can go out to Michler's and we can find some sharks in Florida that way. I was fielding a few questions that I could, uh, some softball ones that I could handle while you were away. <laughs> Here's the Squalicorax tooth, very unique tooth, very triangular, but short, squatty, if you will. Can you move it a little close towards you? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Wow. You can see the serrations, very tight, all the way up and down this tooth. It's got these rounded edges. So the ones that have th that tooth and the one that you showed before that have a much more jagged edge, is that for a yes. different type of diet? Uh, likely. Okay. Uh, we actually know even less about this shark. Okay. This is Edestus. Okay. Uh, some folks call it this, the scissor tooth shark. Uh, so this has got very jagged serrations here. I've seen drawings of those meat. before. The, the, the mm -hmm. One jaw fits inside the other, is that right? Or... Yes. Yeah, it's very... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way. Good way. Very scissor-like. Excellent. But that's a 300 million year old shark. That's one of our oldest shark species in, in the museum. Sorry, I'm trying to read these questions well. Um, uh, let's folks see. are finding uh, megalodons and other shark's teeth in the Outer Banks in North Carolina. Um, especially every year after the hurricanes, there's the opportunity to find things that have washed up. 
Uh, Calvert Cliffs is a great site. There's quite a few places up and down that area that are open to the public. They're approved for public collecting. Uh, South Carolina, obviously, the Cooper River, Peace River. Uh, I've heard the Saint Peace John's River. And Florida, as you mentioned. We're on the St. John's, yeah. Venice Beach is, is very well known for their shark's teeth. Um, someone asked, Army Aviator asked, um, have the Helicoprion ever been found near the U.S.? Uh, not that I know of. Okay. I would. That's that's a dream find for any collector. <laughs> Where would they be found? Do you know? Um, I'm I'm not sure. There's very limited information on the Helicoprion. I would love to see something like that found in the United States. So I'm going to ask my own question. I study plankton and I love whale sharks. And we know that you went over it before that there aren't a lot of um, shark fossils outside of the teeth because the skeletons are made out of cartilage, but the teeth aren't right. They have some calcium in them. They're more bone like, right? right? And that's why they fossilize. So yes. since whale sharks eat plankton and they don't have the big pointy teeth that the others, do we have fossils of whale sharks? Do we know if there were other planktivorous um, fish like whale sharks ages ago? Um, yes, yes. There there are earlier versions of the whale shark that's, it may still be the same whale shark, uh, not very old, uh, but there are whale shark teeth, or whale sharks do have teeth, they're just very, very small. Huh. We have some modern uh, whale shark teeth in our collections, in our comparative collection here in the museum. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things to show the, the visitors because they know how large that shark is. And, and how small like, the teeth oh, are. Let's see its teeth. And the teeth are the smallest teeth I have in our collection. Remind us, because uh, I'm dying to go to your museum now, you're in Rhode Island, is that correct? Yes, yes, we are. Uh, we're in westerly Rhode Island, right on the coast. Nice, very nice. Okay, someone wants to know, but I think we kind of answered this, but we'll ask, well, because maybe anything's possible. Has anyone ever found a full skeleton of Megalodon? Not yet, not yet. Finding the full skeleton of any shark is very difficult. It's only happened in a few rare uh, instances and they weren't complete. Uh, so in order to get cartilage to fossilize, uh, you need very unique conditions. You need very small sediments uh, that can preserve uh, the shape of the cartilage. Uh, that happened in Chile uh, and actually in Florida, there's Dr. Gordon Hubble uh, who I believe helped find a great a prehistoric great white shark in Chile uh, that was not entirely complete, but it was a whole jaw and many vertebrae. Wow. Uh, so one of the most complete sharks that anybody's ever found. I'm waiting for more questions to appear and I feel like I sidetracked you. Did you have more things that you wanted to share specimens before I started interrupting with questions? <laughs> I'm sure I was, I was ready to talk about anything. Okay. Well, yeah, I, obviously there are a lot of different species out there that are, that are also in the shark family. Uh, stingrays, rays, skates, uh, and, and sawfish as well. Uh, one of the things that inspired me as a kid was, oh, yeah. was seeing sawfish. Uh, actually, my family had this bill in the house, uh, and it actually belonged to my father uh, and my stepmother. They got married, and they went to SeaWorld uh, for their honeymoon, and they bought this at SeaWorld. <laughs> uh, so times have changed a little bit. Uh, but seeing the bill of a sawfish is it's very inspiring, uh, especially if, with, uh, with an artist's mind. Um, obviously, we... Uh, are losing sawfish now right. um, yeah. uh, due to overfishing. Um, and a, a lot of it was for the tourism trade as well. Um, but more inspirational are the uh, Pacific cultures and other cultures in the world that used to utilize shark's teeth Weapons. in different ways. Some, yeah. <laughs> sometimes, uh, yeah, yeah. So here, for instance, uh, I have, this is a, a knife from Matty Island that, that has shark teeth you know, tied on uh, so this was a tool. Where is Maddie so Island? Uh, so this is Pacific Islands, Micronesia. Okay. And then we have this club here, which actually has tiger shark teeth all up and down it. Just strapped in there. 
Yeah, nice. There were Native American cultures that used to drill holes in these teeth. You find them in Florida sometimes, huh. um, and they would use them in maybe in similar fashion. We don't know. I used to live in Hawaii for a while, and I, I'm, I'm used to seeing the weapons there. Someone asked if um, there's fossils from prehistoric rays. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll find their teeth, which is very different. Obviously, they're not the same kind of dentition or teeth that a, a shark would have. They have something called dental pavement. Uh, so it's actually like a, a flat series of crushing structures here. Right. One for the bottom of the mouth and one for the top. And on the back, you can see how those structures come together. Excellent. And other fossils from uh, stingrays, you can also find their barbs. This is a very large uh, stingray barb that I found. Excellent. Very beautiful serrations on that as well. Have you seen, I think people are just asking these now so they can see if I slaughter the pronunciation. Have you seen Aliopias grandis? A-L-O-P-I-S. Uh, yes. yes, that's the giant thresher shark, of course. And I actually do have one of those as well. Let's see if I can get a close look at that. This is one of my favorite teeth in the collection oh, wow. too. It's one of the largest ones that I've found. That's Very nice. large prehistoric fresher shark. Very cool. There are other teeth in um, that are found, like the hooked mako shark. Um, this is a false mako shark tooth. Very large tooth. Yeah. Beautiful hook on it. Beautiful shape. It's almost got a yeah. twist to it, it seems. Yeah, just a little bit. A little bit. But there's some question. Uh, that This is Par Paratotus benedine. Uh, there's some question to whether or not these two are actually related. Huh. So they call it a false mako because they're still not quite certain where they want to put it okay. in the lineage. Again, we compare and contrast these teeth with modern shark's teeth and with each other in order to determine what lineage lines they fall into. So someone wants to know, is it true that a shark will eat its own offspring? Is it true if they will eat their own offspring? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, we're observing that more and more now. The more uh, scientists and non-scientists that are in the water with camera equipment uh, following these sharks around, uh, we're seeing some crazy behavior that some have speculated about, but we've never really known. So modern sharks, definitely. Uh, we're seeing different species eating their own young. Uh, there was actually just a special about that the other night. Uh, on uh, National Geographic's new uh, shark fest where they talked about the tiger shark and how if these big tiger sharks uh, that have been left behind in this lagoon move outside of the, of the lagoon, the, mm -hmm. uh, the adults may eat them. Yeah. That's sure kind of common in other species as well, unfortunately. Well, I don't know. It sounds unfortunate being a human, but I, it's a circle of life. Um, okay, I am not going to relay all the individual questions about can you find shark's teeth in this place, this place, and this place. We'll just encourage people to go out and look or do some of their own internet research. Um, That's what I did. That's what I did. When I was a teenager, all I did was try to read as much as I can. I didn't have the internet resources that you do now. Um, so it's, I mean, the internet was around when I was young. But uh, just not it's to the a little different. Yeah. That it is now. Yeah, so it's it's great. Do definitely do the research. Uh, there's shark's teeth. There's fossil sites all over the place in places you wouldn't necessarily think there would be. So Keith, I want to ask a little bit more. So you told us that you didn't have a background in sharks, but you you still you have the Living Shark Museum. So how did you make that happen? I mean, we had Dr. Brian Franks, who's a, a, a great shark scientist from Osearch, and we interviewed him yesterday. But he didn't start with sharks either. He started with desert tortoises. So how how do you let's say we've got someone at home and their passion is sea turtles or their passion is the whale shark? How did you make this happen? I mean, this costs this takes money. This takes time. It does. It definitely does. It, it takes passion. That's what it takes. Um, and stubbornness. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to be willing to, uh, you know, push the envelope a little bit too, because you, you are 
pretty much always alone trying to make it happen. So you have to understand your passion, you know, know what it is you're, you're seeking uh, and get behind it. Um, I was fortunate to have an artistic talent. Um, so when I was young uh, and I was in high school, I was developing my artistic talent. Um, I started doing scientific illustration. Um, and then when I got out of high school and I was trying to break into paleontology without a degree, I was going to anyone, anywhere who would allow me onto a dig site. Um, in the last year of high school, because uh, I lived in Connecticut, I, I met a science teacher uh, who was working with folks from Yale, and they were studying prehistoric uh, fossil footprints uh, from Triassic creatures, dinosaurs, and their likeness. Um, and they were looking at the Hitchcock material, uh, which was some of the first uh, dinosaur footprints ever found in the world. And they were trying to figure out where he and his grad students used to dig and see if any of those sites were still open. Uh, so though I spent a good part of this, uh, that end, that last summer, uh, getting to know different people who were working on uh, that project and going to all the different sites that I could. And some of them were parking lots, <laughs> some of them were just not accessible anymore, and there were a few that still were. So we were able to pull some samples from around. That gave me some good experience, hands-on field experience, to understand what it takes uh, to get into the environment and, and do the geology. Um, and then from there, I just took that experience and compounded it, just went to other uh, projects up and down the coast. And then eventually out west, uh, I went into Montana. Uh, Lots I worked of fossils with tree, out there. I worked with paleontology. Um, to work with marine reptiles uh, from Kansas and Wyoming. Uh, and then I started designing uh, museum exhibits to kind of pay my way because I was only in one place for a little little bit of time. Did you so, find um, fossil shark's teeth, prehistoric shark traces, whether it's actually their teeth or the traces of things they've eaten when you were in Montana? Because that used to be underwater, right? That was a giant inland sea. Yeah, as in, uh, Can Kansas was a little bit more productive in that. Uh, and that's where the tylosaur material that we were finding was, um, and some uh, pretox, uh, some other prehistoric uh, sharks that we were finding there. Uh, that was a little bit more productive. But Montana, I was actually working with some very large dinosaurs, so I was taking whatever work I could get to to better understand uh, how to exhume fossils properly, you know, how to prepare fossils properly. Uh, and then how to exhibit fossils properly, which included drawing these fossils, so this, fine tuning the scientific illustration port, portion of my interest, uh, and then the advent of uh, Photoshop and developing graphics for um, interpretive signage and such that we would use to display this material. So when the recession happened and I moved back east, uh, I had all those skills to use. I helped build a museum in Connecticut. Oh, wow. And that's what set me up to consider uh, creating my own museum at some point, um, as I had been narrowing myself more and more into the world of sharks. And when I moved to the East Coast, obviously, I, I wasn't traveling as much to uh, dig up prehistoric sharks. So I started looking into working with modern sharks in as many different ways as I could. Uh, with the same veracity that I did with prehistoric sharks. And I started uh, monitoring uh, shark tournaments and started going on to the docks and, and doing intake as a contractor for NOAA Fisheries. Okay. Um, I would take any work that I could that would help me understand modern sharks. And I got some opportunities to learn how to dissect um, and then more recently some further opportunities. And eventually uh, got on to uh, the O-Search vessel uh, got a chance to go on to Expedition Nantucket Excellent. and experience, uh, experience ACK being tagged um, and then eventually became a search education ambassador. That's awesome. So somebody yeah. asked how long you've been doing this. It sounds like you started as a child and then yeah. you had a passion, you had an interest, then you, you volunteered on a lot of digs. You followed it wherever it took you, even way from the coastline, and um, just took whatever jobs or opportunities you could to learn more. Is that correct? Does that sum it up? 
absolutely. Yeah, it's, I said yes to a lot of things. I very rarely said no, uh, because I knew my opportunities were limited and I didn't know where these things would lead. And I think it's true in any of the sciences, it's, it's the people you know and work with that help you discover what you're most passionate about uh, and, and help you get there. That's excellent. So if we want to visit the Living Shark Museum when the pandemic's over and it's safe, can you tell us a bit about it? How, how big is it? Do we pay a fee when we enter? Can we make donations to keep you guys going? What's, what's, what's the background? Uh, so right now, I mean, after the pandemic is over, hopefully we'll grow. We we're supposed to go into a much larger space this year. So we are in a very small footprint right now. I'm occupying just under a thousand feet, okay. uh, thousand square feet, uh, with maybe three quarters of that being display space, and the rest of it being archives um, and office. So I have our space packed full of artifacts from all over the world. Obviously, I've been carrying around my prehistoric material for 25 years. Um, so now it has a home, and I started collecting. Uh, as many different artifacts as I could that could help me tell the story of the, of sharks. Uh, because these are all things that I used to see in books and magazines growing up and documentaries. So how cool would it be to have all these things under the same roof? You know, things like, you used to always hear about things like shark, shark chaser and, and shark repellent and, and shark darts, you know, that were used to protect uh, soldiers, or, or I should say sailors, from sharks. Uh, and I, you'd always see these things, but- like, Okay, how, how I don't know anything know? about these things. Back up. So tell me, what is shark chaser? It's to chase it away. I take it you're not chasing after sharks with it. <clears throat> no, so I, sharks are, are just a mystery. Uh, they have been a mystery for so long. Uh, people didn't really want to put a lot of energy into understanding them. I think they enjoyed that they were one of the few monsters left in the world. Uh, so it, it really didn't, uh, things didn't really change into World War II uh, when the USS Indianapolis went down, uh, like Quint talks about in Jaws. Uh, and so many people lost their lives, uh, not just to drowning, but also to sharks. And the US Navy realized that they needed a response to this, a technical response. And so they brought scientists together. Uh, they brought engineers together. They tried to come up with as many ideas as they could to protect soldiers, protect uh, the sailors uh, from sharks in those survival situations. And one of the things they came up with was shark chaser, which is a shark repellent. Um, it, it's actually just a cake of dye uh, that has copper acetate in it, uh, which is a chemical uh, release. Well, it's actually ammonium acetate that's released uh, when a when a dead shark uh, is breaking down in, in the water. Uh, so they thought that would repel sharks. In some cases, it probably attracted them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the dye actually was supposed to last about three and a half hours and keep a cloud around you. And really, what it was was a placebo. Uh, mm -hmm. You you felt more confident in your survival. And so you didn't do all the things that actually attract the sharks. Like thrashing. Like scream and yeah. splash. And uh, so some of the PSAs they had back then, they were telling you to scream underwater, like put your head underwater and scream. It just seems like a really bad idea. <laughs> and so this, that was Shark Chaser. And, this and they spike? actually used this until 1975. Wow. It was in, it was actually in production. Can you show us this, yeah, the spike again? Yeah, the shark dart is a really cool tool. Um, unfortunately, yes, this did work very well. Uh, this was a lethal dose, uh, and it has a CO2 cartridge in here. Okay. Uh, and it would actually just release that CO2 through a hole at the end of this needle. And if you could push that needle through the skin of the shark, uh, you could push that gas into the shark. It would throw off the shark's equilibrium, huh. uh, obviously putting a, a, a ball of gas in that shark. Um, and they would usually eject their own stomachs. Ooh. They're gross. Uh, and they would suffocate, unfortunately. So it was a lethal action. Uh, this would come on a Hawaiian sling or you know, a long staff uh -huh. that divers could use. These were originally developed uh, for the Apollo missions. Uh, so when 
uh, yeah, when the astronauts would come back from space and splash down in the Pacific in shark-infested waters, uh, they would be protected. Of course, all that stuff was on live TV. So they didn't want these astronauts coming out like, wow, we made it back all the way from space, only to get eaten by a shark, which not good for publicity. probably never would have happened. Uh, but just to be sure, just in case. they overcompensated and they created the shark, the shark dark. I love and it. I just learned, uh, well, actually, I didn't just learn that. That was something else. But the, the shark dart was released uh, for the public as well. Huh. And it was actually used by a lot of divers. So I know people um, actually in our region in Florida that like to dive in the St. John's River. Again, they're like you. And um, I, I would say somewhat crazy. No, I don't like to scuba dive in dark, murky water personally, but they, they love it. Yeah. And sometimes they have a plethora of fossils. Do people send you fossils? Are you accepting fossils or are you, are you full up? I'm always accepting fossils, <laughs> of course. I mean, everything I have here is my personal collection. About 90% of what's on display in, in fossil material are my personal finds uh, found and prepared by me. By me. But um, I'm always looking to diversify the collection, especially if it tells us or helps me tell the story better about maybe some of the other creatures in those ecosystems or from other localities that maybe I haven't been to. So we're getting a fair number of questions, but a lot of them, I think, are questions that I would rather save. We've got a lot of shark people on this week. Um, we, tomorrow at one, and then uh, most of our content on Thursday is shark related. So I'd rather keep it towards prehistoric sharks and fossils. But I do see one here. Um, I have a question. Did you ever track a frilled shark because they're prehistoric? Are there prehistoric frilled sharks? Yes. Okay. Yes, there are. Um, what a crazy shark. <laughs> tell us about it. What makes it crazy? It's just a, such a strange looking shark. Uh, it's pro It looks more prehistoric than any other shark we have, I think, living on Earth at this time. Huh. Uh, just a very strange, uh, just a strange design. Okay, but they're all, there are no living species of frill sharks? Oh, absolutely, there are. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes. Um, has there been evidence of prehistoric saw sharks? And I think you addressed that earlier. Yes, yeah. there have been, uh, even as far back as, as the time of the dinosaurs and the Cretaceous. Uh, so just, just like shark's teeth, uh, we only find the teeth on the, the bills of the sawfish. You know, for instance, I have this sawfish tooth here, uh, which has a oh, big wow. barb on it. It's a really <laughs> cool tooth, so I imagine a bill like this, covered in teeth like that. Wow. It's a very, very menace, menacing hook. Like yeah. And, and so that <laughs> bill is also made of cartilage? And so when, the, when you find the prehistoric ones, you only find the shark and not, or the teeth and not the bill? Yes. Okay. I have someone very eagerly, no, I wouldn't say a lot, but have repeated a few times to tell you thanks that you're amazing and thank you for everything that you do, so. Oh, well, thank you very much. Oh. Is there anything else you wanna share before we wrap up? Um, well, I just wanna reiterate that uh, I've been very fortunate on this journey to uh, be where I'm at. I'm still very young, so there's, you know, uh, who knows where all this will go. Um, the opportunities that have come because of this have been amazing. And I'm now working more in an educator capacity than anything. So um, I'm excited to be able to do events like this and share my story and sh share shark facts, be it prehistoric or modern. Um, and I deeply encourage you, if you have the opportunity to go to school for this work, please do. Uh, and do what you can to help protect the sharks that we have uh, before we don't. Really good points. And this um, inter or interview discussion will be available online after the fact. So if you want to point anyone to it or anyone that joined us near the end that had questions or um, if, if one of your questions wasn't answered, it may be because we answered it in the beginning and you joined later. Um, but I bet you could also email Living Sharks Museum and Keith would probably do his, his best to answer those questions. And we also, again, have shark experts on later in the week that might be able to answer those questions as well. 
Keith, thank you so much. We're definitely, I know I'm going to go check the, out the Living Sharks Museum the next time I'm in Rhode Island. I will reach out to you ahead of time and let you know I'm coming, so maybe I'll get a private tour. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and uh, if I come across any awesome shark fossils, I'm going to send them your way, because if they sit in my house, only a few people will see them. Uh-oh, cut off. Okay, sorry, your screen went away for just a second on my end. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it, Keith. Oh. Thank you for having me. Bye.